The landscape of movies today is divided, to say the least. It's a war between competing streaming services and underperforming box office returns. Maybe something goes right to streaming that you've never heard of, or maybe something bombed and studios are pulling it out of theaters, or maybe something underperformed on streaming and it just disappears into the void. It really is such a strange evolution from a time in the 50s and the 60s when going to the movies was an experience. You got dressed up, there was the big marquee with the bright lights to get you excited for epics like Ben-Hur and Lawrence of Arabia. Movies on a scale that simply hadn't been seen before. There really was a grand spectacle to it, and rooted deep in that era of cinema were 70mm presentations. 70mm refers to the size of the film that was fed through a projector in the theater for you to watch on a massive screen surrounded by people in awe of what they were seeing. But why does that matter? Why is 70 mm Millimeter associated with this old school Hollywood flair for epic films and special theater experiences. Well, first, let's go back to the beginning. Not quite that far. As film came into existence in the 1800s and people began to use it to capture motion and slowly create movies for the first time, there weren't exactly hard standards for how you should be shooting or what cameras to use or you know, even the size of the film itself. You couldn't exactly enroll in film school back then. Motion picture technology is difficult. You have to have film that stops, gets the image, advances, stops, gets the next image, and it has to do that 20, 30 times a second. 35 millimeter slowly became the standard for movies in the 1890s and into the early 1900s. But even after that period, there was still such a variety of obscure and non-standard film sizes being used for movies around the world. Now I know not all of these were widely used or even professional formats, but in the past there did exist formats like 19 millimeter wide film or 54 millimeter wide or 51 or 68. 38, 48, 17 and a half, 13, 21. Movie making was kind of like the wild west for a bit. You also have to think about that each size of film needs its own sized camera, its own sized projector, things to go along with that sized film to make it work. For most of us, when we're thinking about movies on film, we're thinking about 35 millimeter, or at least I'm going to assume that when you're thinking about movies on film, you have at least the base understanding to be thinking about 35 millimeter. But the basics of how this work applies to 70 millimeter movies as well, so pay attention. When you make a movie with film, the film itself moves through the camera and is exposed one frame at a time to the light. The film is then chemically developed and the image that you exposed is produced. Most of the time, this image is a negative version of what you captured. Positive copies are then made from that negative, and these are called prints, and they're used during the editing process. A very complex process, by the way, when done entirely on film, which involves cutting and splicing. Wanna lace up what you got on Barely We Dance? It's up now. I'll put some music on it. Then that final edited film would have more prints made of it for projection. These prints are what go through projectors night after night to entertain an audience, or they used to. Digital projection, of course, is now the norm, but theaters really only started switching over to digital in the 2010s, which is a neat little fact that surprises a lot of people who don't know that much about film. Film prints can store audio as well as picture. Early prints might have variable density soundtracks, which look like a series of dashes and lines beside the frame. Or more commonly, a print might have an optical soundtrack, which is a waveform that's converted into sound in a special area of the film projector. Or a print might have a magnetic soundtrack, which is like a cassette tape. Kind of. It's a magnetic audio strip that holds the sound of the movie. And later film prints could even store signals and marks for syncing with a separate digital audio system during projection. This is a 35mm print of a movie trailer. The picture is here in this frame, and an optical soundtrack is down the side next to the frame. This is an older print, so it only has an optical soundtrack on it. 
If you take this print and move it fast enough through a projector, or in this case, a Steenbeck flatbed film editor, then all those pictures start to merge together and come alive. If you've seen a lot of movies, and you probably have, or at least one or two, you've likely noticed that there are a lot of different aspect ratios, which is the size of the image on your screen. Many old movies were using a nearly square frame. This is called a 1.37 to 1 ratio, and it was the Academy Standard for movies officially starting in 1932. The aspect ratio refers to the width of the image in comparison to the height of it. So 1.37 to 1 means that the picture's width is 1.37 times its height. 1.7 to 1 is a picture with a width that is 1.7 times its height. 2.39 to 1 is a picture with a width that is 2.39 times its height, and so on. I could keep going. If you want, you get it. Brody. Everybody getting this so far? So if you go back far enough, movies look like this. Before they started to look like this. <laughs> Widescreen. There were some widescreen formats that existed early on, but none of these were used frequently and consistently enough that they broke through into mainstream cinemas. One notable widescreen attempt came in the 1920s when Fox Studios, we remember Fox Studios, right? Introduced the grandeur format. Grandeur used 70mm film, and Fox commissioned cameras to be made by the Mitchell Camera Corporation which could take this wider film. It also required new projectors and theaters in order to show these film prints though, and that was a bit of a tough sell. A handful of shorts and features were made using the grandeur format, and I mean, you know, you know these movies, they're, we've all seen them. The Fox Movie Stone Follies of 1929, uh, Happy Days in 1929, Song of My Heart, 1930, and The Big Trail in 1930. The classics, absolute classics. Grandeur was only around from 1929 to 1930 and did have some success, but it was poorly timed. Only a few years after it was introduced, the Great Depression stole its thunder. You had an industry that didn't want to invest in something like this format that required new projectors to use it, especially because the movie industry had only just started to move into sound pictures as well. So Fox grandeur failed, the Great Depression happened, World War II began, and years later, another important event occurred that changed how movies would be released forever. In 1948, the Supreme Court told big movie studios that they needed to separate themselves from the theater chains that they owned. This meant that movie studios could no longer monopolize theaters with their own movies. That was very important, a very smart decision, and something that I'm glad that we don't really see that much of anymore. Disney came to the Arclight people and said, no. Wow. You are going to play Star Wars in the Cinerama Dome for the entire holiday season. And if you don't, if you honor your deal with the Hateful Eight, we will not allow you to have Star Wars, the biggest movie in the world. We will not allow you to show it at any of your arc like movie theaters. Oh. Television was slowly coming into existence during this time as well. A dynamic industry employing more than a million. Television an unparalleled blending of science and art. So studios both had bigger competition with their releases in theaters and competition against televisions in homes. This created the need for something new, something to give people reason to go see a movie in theaters. Average attendance was 50% of what it had been in 1948. Television was mostly responsible for that. People were staying home, they weren't going to movies. The studios knew they had to do something to lure those people away from their living rooms, so movies became bigger. 
That's the operative word, bigger. Bigger in budget, with spectacles like the robe and the Ten Commandments, that sort of thing, and also bigger in size. On the 35mm side of things, there were formats including CinemaScope, VistaVision, and Cinerama. CinemaScope was the introduction of anamorphic lenses used when shooting on 35mm film, which allowed you to squeeze a widescreen image into an almost square 35mm film frame. Cinerama used three projectors running in unison to show a massive image in special theaters with curved screens. And this is Cinerama. VistaVision used 35mm film but ran it horizontally through the camera for a larger frame yielding finer grain and sharper images, similar to what IMAX would do years later, and I'll come back to that. And this is the VistaVision film negative, twice as big, twice as clear as the old style negative. But this was also the perfect time to introduce something that didn't even use 35mm. In the early 1950s, producer Mike Todd created Todd AO. Todd AO was a new widescreen film format which fully introduced 70mm movies to the world with its first film, Oklahoma, in 1955. Todd AO was used for about 18 films, which include some of the most recognizable films of the 50s and 60s. Around the World in 80 Days, <laughs> South Pacific, <laughs> The Alamo, <laughs> The Sound of Music, so do, la, ti, do, re, do. Dr. Doolittle, <laughs> Ah, I see. He says there's a faint smell of garlic coming from the southeast. And this, is how 70 millimeter movies work. Well, let's not lose any time, you must learn. 70 millimeter refers to the width of the film print that runs through the projector in a movie theater. But when the movie is being made, it uses 65 millimeter wide film. 65 millimeter film is loaded into a camera and a frame is captured that is five perforations tall. Perforations being a fancy word for sprocket hole. These perforations are held in place with pins during shooting or printing and are used for transport and precise registration. The massive size of this 65 millimeter frame really becomes apparent when compared with a typical four perf tall 35 millimeter movie frame or a two perf tall 16 millimeter movie frame. And you know what, I'll throw some Super 8 film in there for a size comparison as well. After this 65mm film is shot and developed, it is then printed onto 70mm print stock. So 70mm film doesn't go through a camera, it only goes through projectors. In printing, a 65mm negative is placed against 70mm film. Each frame of the 65mm negative is exposed onto the 70mm film, and when developed, you have a positive print that's ready for the theater. This printing process is made easier because the perforations of 65mm camera stock are exactly in line with 70mm print stock. The extra width of the print film is on the outside of the perforations. The common saying is that the 5mm difference between 65 and 70 is used to store the soundtrack on the print, but it's actually just a little bit more than that. During the printing process, when a 65mm negative is copied into a positive, the frame size is reduced slightly so you end up with about 7 or 8mm of extra space to put a soundtrack. 70mm prints can hold 6 tracks of magnetic audio on them, which is more than a 35mm print could hold. This is a sample of a 70mm print designed to correct for the distortion from a high projection angle. Also you can see the soundtracks. Tadeo carried 6 tracks of magnetic sound five behind the screen, and then a, a sixth track that fed speakers throughout the auditorium. Although just like with 35, more modern prints have marks to sync with digital audio systems. 65 millimeter allows for a massive amount of detail to be captured, and it's been said to have a resolution equivalent to 12K. But measuring film in digital resolution is a complex and heavily debated topic, so just know that it's an incredibly detailed image. And that is what makes 70mm so impressive. It's a big frame that requires less magnification to get a massive image on the screen. It can capture more information in comparison to 35, and it could offer a more intensive soundtrack as well. 70mm absolutely has its fans. Glorious 70mm. 
The Todd AO system took inspiration from Cinerama, which again used three 35mm projectors in unison projecting on a large curved screen. The idea was that Todd AO would do this but with one system instead of three, and early Todd AO cameras used a crazy fisheye lens to shoot so that it could project onto this curved screen. Todd AO cameras also initially ran at 30 frames per second in contrast to the standard 24 frames per second used for most films. This only lasted for two productions though. Oklahoma in 1955 and around the world in 80 days in 1956. To get the most money out of Oklahoma, the film had to be shown in conventional theaters as well as in their converted Tadeo theaters. So a 35 millimeter version in CinemaScope was made. The film was shot in both Tadeo at 30 frames per second and simultaneously in CinemaScope at 24 frames per second. They would shoot the same scene in tandem, CinemaScope and then Todd A.O. and then CinemaScope and Todd A.O. You're almost shooting two complete films. It's not like you've got, them, got your two cameras side by side and just shooting it twice. It has to actually be photographed and staged once for one camera or once for the other camera. After that, all Todd A.O. productions were done in 24 frames per second and the curved screen was dropped starting with the production of South Pacific in 1958. Besides Todd A.O., MGM Studios approached Panavision to develop a 70mm film setup in the 1950s as well. Panavision system used the same 65mm negative and 70mm print stock, but with Panavision made cameras and lenses. Early on it was sometimes referred to as MGM 65, but eventually became known as Ultra Panavision. The big difference between Todd A.O. and Ultra Panavision was that Ultra Panavision was anamorphic 65mm. Like I said, there's a ton of different aspect ratios and versions of widescreen out there. Often when shooting on film, the image is matted later on to achieve a widescreen aspect ratio. The drawbacks of this though are that you're only using this little area in the frame, which is often just four perfs tall on 35mm, and this area around the frame is wasted. There are variations on this though, such as 35mm two and three perf tall frames, which require specific cameras to shoot, but do allow you to just only capture that widescreen image right onto the negative. Or this four perf area can be entirely taken advantage of by using anamorphic lenses. Most of the time when using cameras, we're using spherical lenses, which capture the image onto your film or sensor without affecting the aspect ratio. If we want to capture an even wider aspect ratio, then you can shoot using anamorphic lenses. Anamorphic lenses capture a wider frame, but compress the image horizontally or uh, stretch the image vertically, depending on how you look at it. It gives it this squished or stretched kind of look to it is what I'm saying. Then a projector with an anamorphic lens will de-squeeze the image back to its widescreen aspect ratio. Put them on. Oh, I, I ain't wearing no handcuffs. You put those on or you can stop worrying about this whole thing right now. This allows for a wide aspect ratio to be captured, but it still takes up the same amount of space on the film as with non-anamorphic lenses. It also makes better use of this space because it's entirely filled with the image. Sometimes if you're looking at getting 35 millimeter prints, like a movie trailer, for example, you can tell if it's anamorphic because it will be presented in scope. Scope is anamorphic, flat is non-anamorphic. So Ultra Panavision 70 used anamorphic lenses to create a super widescreen movie with an aspect ratio of 2.76 to 1. Uh, you lose your life, you Todd AO was non-anamorphic 70 and had a less intense widescreen aspect ratio of 2.20 to 1. <laughs> oh well, we all make mistakes. <laughs> um. Ultra Panavision wasn't used often, and only a handful of movies ever made have been shot with these cameras and lenses. In 2015, who else but Quentin Tarantino resurrected and shot with this Ultra Panavision format for his movie The Hateful Eight. So if you remember like eight years ago when Tarantino wouldn't shut up about 70mm, that's what he was talking about. No one had used Ultra Panavision since the 1960s, which is kind of why it was a big deal. These lenses hadn't been used since uh, the movie Khartoum with uh, Charlton Heston and uh, Laurence Olivier. 
So Bob is asking about them, and they're telling him, and he's thinking, whoa, this could exactly be what Quentin would like. Quentin would love these. The movie shot using Ultra Panavision 70 are Raintree County in 1957, Ben-Hur in 1959, certain scenes from How the West Was Won in 1962, Mutiny on the Bounty in 1962. Isn't it amazing? It's a mad, 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 mad world in 1963. Now, come in a minute! Get in the time! The Fall of the Roman Empire in 1964. <sighs> The Greatest Story Ever Told in 1965. They will be done. The Hallelujah Trail in 1965. Let's get them wagons moved up! Battle of the Bulge in 1965. I hear GHQ is cutting orders to ship us home for Christmas. Khartoum in 1966. Everything was always so big, outsized, larger than life. The Hateful Eight in 2015. I am calling you a liar, Senior Bob. And uh, Christopher Robin in 2018 also used uh, some Ultra Panavision as well for some reason. And uh, you know what? The director of that did not talk about it nearly as much as Quentin Tarantino talked about it for The Hateful Eight. What to do indeed. By shooting it in 65 millimeter, I'm guaranteeing to some degree or another, there will be 70 millimeter film prints out there in the world screening for people who care. No. Ultra Panavision. When you absolutely positively got to wow everyone in the room, except no substitutes. Panavision also had a non-anamorphic 70mm system called Super Panavision 70. Super Panavision is basically the same as Todd AO with the same aspect ratio, but with Panavision cameras. Super Panavision was also more widely used than Ultra Panavision for movies including West Side Story, You love stone on these streets, Lawrence of Arabia, The trick, William Potter, is not minding that it hurts, My Fair Lady, <laughs> Two thousand and one, a space odyssey. Unfortunately, that sounds a little like famous last words. Chitty chitty bang bang. <laughs> and even Tron in nineteen eighty two. I play video games better than anybody. Actually, Tron is really unique because the real world live action stuff was filmed in sixty five millimeter. The computer world live action stuff was shot using sixty five millimeter black and white film and put onto Vista Vision thirty five millimeter, and then the Vista Vision thirty five millimeter was printed onto seventy millimeter. I don't really care that much about Tron, but how Tron was made is really cool. What game is it? It's called The Last of Us. Is and it they out adapted now? It into, oh my yeah. God, a few years ago, yeah. Because I got sucked into a video. Which game, one? You know, Tron. So you had 70 millimeter features primarily in the form of Todd AO, Super Panavision, and Ultra Panavision. There were some variations such as Sovscope 70, which was a copy of Todd AO in the Soviet Union, where many, many films were produced in 70 millimeter from the 1960s into the 1990s. There is a great website dedicated to 70 millimeter as well called in70millimeter.com that you should check out if you're interested in this topic and want to see more lists and posters and pictures and information and just just, you know, all sorts of nerdy stuff related to 70 millimeter movies. Movies shot in 65 and projected in 70 millimeter were often big epics like Ben-Hur and Lawrence of Arabia, or even these huge classic musicals like Hello Dolly and West Side Story. Not a ton of films were shot this way, but in the 50s and 60s, the ones that were stood out. These were movies that could be marketed based on how they were being presented, so people knew that seeing them in theaters was an experience, something that couldn't be replicated on television at home. Going out to see a big exciting showing of West Side Story in the 60s was very different from staying in and watching I Love Lucy. Hey, no hate for I Love Lucy though. Especially as people came out of World War II and there was this huge boom in certain countries, it makes sense that these grand presentation formats for movies caught on in a way that they struggled to before the 50s. When Tarantino released The Hateful Eight, one of the big things he did was presented as a roadshow release in limited locations. A roadshow is, well, uh, let's just let this nerd talk about it. The uh, roadshow started in the late 50s and then like, committed to them really big time in the 60s. Some of them were like musicals, some of them were historical epics, other ones were like Ice Station Zebra, Battle of the Bulge, Sand Pebbles. Normally there would be about like 10 extra minutes 
uh, added to the movie that you'd only get to see in the roadshow version. It was a limited theatrical engagement with reserved seating, a musical overture, an intermission, and they also gave you a program. A few classics released this way were Gone with the Wind, El Cid, and Ben-Hur, each presented in this grand fashion. It's really the way to go. So you got a little extra flair and also a program with road shows. Sometimes you got that overture or the intermission with the music. They were shown in big fancy theaters and they had this spectacle to them. Here in Toronto back in 2015, I was lucky to see the Rojo version of The Hateful Eight at the Varsity. There is also the Tiff Theatre here in Toronto, which usually shows some 70mm movies at the end of the year, such as Lawrence of Arabia and 2001 A Space Odyssey and Vertigo, but not always new releases like The Hateful Eight. The Varsity is just a fancy location uh, that is part of the Cineplex theatre chain, which sucks. Cineplex sucks. Want to own the movie you're about to watch? Keep your ticket stub and go online to upgrade within 48 hours to a no, super stop, ticket. You'll get an early please, digital stop, copy of this please, movie for 500 extra scene points. Just start the movie. Just start the movie. No, just the show me the movie. Just show, show me the movie. movie. So not one of those glamorous cinemas of old, but I do at least enjoy having the chance to see things projected on 70 millimeter when it's an option. So things like Dunkirk and The Hateful Eight, but also certain movies still get 70 millimeter releases even though they weren't shot entirely in 65 millimeter originally. Things like Wonder Woman and uh, Kong Skull Island and Joker, which leads me to the next chapter in 70 millimeters life. After a brief intermission. After the 1960s, 65mm slowly fell out of fashion for movies. Not so much the ability to go to a nice theater and see something projected on a 70mm print, but more so people actually shooting on 65. The cameras were less versatile and it was expensive to shoot, distribute, and project on this format, so it remained a special thing to see a movie do it. Of course, these big Todd AO and Panavision films were also released in 35mm to allow for wider distribution. You could go see My Fair Lady in 70 on the big screen in a more glamorous venue, or you could catch it in 35 in a smaller, more local theater maybe. It's impressive, but it was never meant to replace the standard. So in order to take advantage of theaters that could project in 70mm and present a more premium experience, studios would take film shot on 35 and put them into those venues anyways. In the mid-1960s, people like Panavision, Kodak, and Technicolor started to do 35mm to 70mm enlargement prints, and these are called blow-ups. A blow up is when you take a movie that was shot on one format, such as 35mm, and then you enlarge it during printing onto a larger format, 70mm. That way, it could be released in theaters as a special presentation. This was done with a lot of movies over the years, especially as things moved out of this era of Hollywood epics and spectacles and into an exciting new generation. Blockbusters. The appeal was that 70mm prints could be sharper, brighter, and allow for six tracks of audio. However, 35mm blow-ups kind of started to replace needing to fully shoot on 65 in order to present in 70. There have been over 300 movies blown up to 70mm prints for release. Ultimately, it's cheaper to shoot 35, but then these special showings would give you that nice little box office bump. It's a little like how digital 3D movies can be shot in 3D like Avatar, or they can be converted in the post-production process to be in 3D like Harry Potter. You could go see Back to the Future in 70mm, or Ghostbusters, or the Star Wars films, or the Star Trek films, or the Indiana Jones films, Alien, Apocalypse, Clubs Now, Batman, Dead Poets Society, I don't know, Die Hard, E.T., The Godfather uh, Part 3, uh, Good Morning Vietnam, uh, Grease, uh, Grease 2, the, the Muppet Movie, <sighs> Crawl, Independence Day, sp uh, <laughs> Spaceballs, The Thing, Top Gun, 
Who Framed Roger Rabbit, all of these movies had 70 millimeter showings over the years. It's also interesting that Jaws, the movie that many people kind of consider to be the first blockbuster, never had a 70 millimeter print. But so many of these blockbusters that followed did, including Spielberg's next film, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. 65 millimeter film didn't die off though, and in the late 1970s, it found use in the special effects process on these exciting new blockbusters. As special effects technology and techniques advanced, there were tons of movies in the 70s and 80s that would shoot special portions on 65 millimeter film stock for use in the effects process. These are movies like Blade Runner, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Star Trek The Motion Picture, Ghostbusters, Die Hard. All of these movies have portions that were shot in 65mm for use during the special effects process while most of the movie was shot on 35. 65 millimeter is larger and it captures more information, something that is incredibly useful when you're doing an effects process like optical printing. Optical printing and old school special effects processes that were done on film for movies is a topic entirely of their own. But in order to kind of better illustrate just what I'm talking about in this portion, uh, let's take a look at just your common household Oxbury 1700 optical printer. Everybody has one. In the special effects process, there can be a lot of compositing involved which is when elements of a scene exist on separate pieces of film. These elements need to be re-photographed and composited together into a finished shot. With an optical printer like this, film with different elements can be threaded up in these areas, and then a light source projects these frames onto fresh unexposed film in the printer. You use a machine like this to get those individual elements onto one piece of film. It shines a light through two separate pieces of film, so their images are combined and that new image is re-photographed. Using the larger 65mm film in this process means much more detail to work from, and less generational quality loss during the printing process. Ultimately, these 65mm effect shots would be finished onto 35mm to use with the rest of the footage. So slowly movies shot in 65 and projected in 70 did very much drop off. In the 1990s, the documentary Baraka was released, which used Todd A.O. to shoot 65mm. In that same decade, Far and Away and Hamlet were also released, both of which shot on 65mm as well. Cannot you tell that? Every fool can tell that. In 2011, the documentary Samsara was released, which shot with Panavision 65mm cameras, and then in 2015, The Hateful Eight with Ultra Panavision. So it's out there, but we're not exactly seeing a big 65 project released every summer. But this format never entirely went away. I mean, 65mm camera stock and 70mm print stock are both still in production from Kodak, and you can give them a call right now and order some. It'll cost you, but you can do it. Uh, also uh, note that minimum order quantity for these rolls. Into the 1990s and 2000s, the use of 65 for effects shots also dropped off in favor of digital workflows, and is much less common today, but again, hasn't entirely disappeared for that use. The 80s and 90s also gave way to the multiplex, cinemas that put several screens in the building instead of one and were very different from the big glamorous cinemas where you would find those special 70mm showings. The 90s also saw the introduction of digital sound systems such as Dolby Digital which worked with 35mm prints, so that appeal of six tracks and fancy audio only on 70mm prints didn't matter anymore either. The popularity of blow-ups really dropped off as well as you can see from this list. From 1963 to 1998, there was at least one 35mm to 70mm blow-up every year until 1999, and then gaps after 2001 until movies from directors such as Christopher Nolan and Paul Thomas Anderson began to revive it a bit. It's interesting to see that within the last 10 years, there have been less gaps. Speaking of Christopher Nolan, 65mm film found another use in the mid-1960s with IMAX films, a format that Nolan has a personal affinity for based especially on his recent work. 
IMAX cameras take 65 mm film but turns it sideways to capture a big image that is 15 perforations long, much larger in comparison to 5 perf 65 mm film. Because the film is run horizontally through the camera, it's able to capture a very different frame with an aspect ratio of 1.43 to 1. I believe whatever doesn't kill you simply makes you stranger. When you see IMAX movies projected on film, that again is a 70mm print from the 65mm negative, but it runs through a projector in the same way it runs through the camera, horizontally. Regular 70mm showings project the film just as 35 is projected, vertically. IMAX had a big appeal for showings of short documentaries in specially built theaters, like the Cinesphere here in Toronto, the sort of movies that you would see at a science center or a similar venue. Like regular 70mm though, many non-IMAX films have been blown up for IMAX presentation. You can tell because sequences shot in full IMAX have that special aspect ratio, but sequences not shot in IMAX don't use the entire frame. Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince was shot on 35mm but was blown up and shown in IMAX which means 70mm IMAX prints were made. This frame is originally from 35mm footage so it doesn't fill the entire frame. As I'm talking about film and prints and projectors, just to put things into perspective a little bit, one minute of 35 millimeter film, that is a four perforation tall frame, is 90 feet. 90 feet of 35 millimeter four perf is one minute of footage. One minute of 65 millimeter film, that is a five perf tall frame on the film, is 112 feet. And one minute of IMAX film, that is uh, the 15 perforation long frame, is something like 330 feet of film for IMAX, for a minute of IMAX film. So that maybe helps things make a little bit of sense when Christopher Nolan says that a IMAX 70 millimeter print of Oppenheimer is 11 miles for a, uh, what, three hour movie? 11 miles. In recent years, we've seen a bit of a resurgence of movies shot that incorporate 65mm film. Directors like Christopher Nolan, Tarantino, and Paul Thomas Anderson, of course, are passionate about this stuff and using film in general. The Hateful Eight was shot entirely in Ultra Panavision 65, Dunkirk was shot largely in IMAX 65, but with portions shot in regular 65. Other recent movies that have made use of 65mm in their productions include Shutter Island, Inception, The Tree of Life, Snow White and the Huntsman, Gravity, the Master, Jurassic World, Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, Murder on the Orient Express, Death on the Nile, Tenant, The Nutcracker in the Four Realms, Look It Up, No Time to Die, and Nope. Today, productions that are shooting in 65 often use the Ariflex 765, which was produced in 1989, or the Panavision System 65, which was put out in 1991. Unless, of course, you're digging out that old Ultra Panavision system. This summer, Oppenheimer is the big new release from Christopher Nolan, which used a ton of 65mm film stock during its production. Like Dunkirk, Oppenheimer shot using IMAX cameras, which are absolute beasts. Also, we got headlines like this, which are uh, kind of misleading. Oppenheimer has sequences that were shot in black and white on Kodak's double X black and white negative stock. Previously, you could only get this in 16 and 35 millimeter, but they cut it for 65 millimeter for Nolan on this production. Not exactly inventing new film, just uh, cutting it in a different size. So movies shot with 65 and having 70 millimeter prints made haven't completely disappeared, but they're rare. It's much more likely that a movie will shoot certain sequences on 65 in combination maybe with IMAX 65 or 35 and even digital in place of decades ago when an entire film would be shot on 65. In 2012, Paul Thomas Anderson shot The Master primarily in 5 perf 65 millimeter with just a bit of 35 in there as well. He used Panavision cameras and then seven millimeter prints were made and shown in certain theaters. It is cool to know that there's still a dedication from filmmakers and cinematographers out there to work with 65 and release and present on 70 millimeter, whether it's 70 millimeter 5 perf or IMAX 15 perf. And clearly this dedication to a certain style of filmmaking does strike a chord with audiences as we've seen with the popularity of Oppenheimer and its 70 millimeter screenings being extended. In the past year, IMAX has even announced that they're developing new films cameras instead of just having a focus on digital filmmaking. 
Of course, that doesn't mean it's easy to find theaters that are projecting on film when these movies do come out. Here in Toronto, there's that one Cineplex location that's showing Oppenheimer on 5 per 70 millimeter, and a handful in Canada that are showing it in IMAX 70, which is awesome, but most people are just gonna go see it digitally. Unfortunately, at some of these Cineplex venues, as well as some other big theater chains outside of Canada, 70 millimeter showings of Oppenheimer have been marred by projection and technical issues. Sure, digital projection is less involved than film projection, but this is maybe less about a tired digital versus film conversation and more about how theater chains underpay and underprepare projectionists and employees in general. So what should be an exciting and different theatrical experience turns into headlines and uh, posts like these. To wax poetic here, there is something special about seeing a movie in a theater that's projecting on film. It's the flicker and the little imperfections and the care that goes into making it run, but it's pretty reliant on the theater that you're seeing it in being one that cares about what it's doing. And I don't get that sense from Cineplex when I hear stories about projectionists quitting because they're underpaid. As I've been working on this video and exploring this era of film, it's easy to get caught up in the grand epics and impressive feat of the movies that made use of this format and this presentation style. But I'm also reminded that these roadshows and these movies, all this glamour and this flair really just wasn't something that everyone of that era could enjoy. I'm trying to find clips to showcase as reference for some of these movies in the edit of this video, like West Side Story and Lawrence of Arabia, and as beautiful as some of these films can be, there's also things like actors in brownface that feel very, very dated. Also several of these epics and quite a few big movies from that period are Bible movies, so it's definitely lacking a lot of diversity that would have allowed for a much more interesting variety of movies in that era. Here's the director of nearly every Todd A.O., Super Panavision, and Ultra Panavision film. I'm not saying there's not talent here, but I am saying that there's not a lot of variety going on, guys. As I have gone through these films, I do think it's worth highlighting some of the women who have notable production credits on these largely male-dominated films. Marjorie Fowler edited Dr. Doolittle, Anne V. Coates edited Lawrence of Arabia and Those Magnificent Men in Their Flying Machines, Dorothy Spencer edited Cleopatra, Dorothy Kingsley was one of the writers on the screenplay of Can Can, Tanya Rose co-wrote It's a Mad 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 World, and Sonia Levine was one of the writers on the screenplay of Oklahoma, the first Todd A.O. picture. Even outside of these examples, there's a long history especially of women editors who have worked on very, very notable movies, and sometimes those contributions are overlooked. I really like some of these films. I really like a bunch of these films. But it's not worth ignoring the dated and problematic elements of these classic movies. There are big technical feats from this era of filmmaking, and a ton of talent both in front of and behind the camera, and I love looking at the history of it all. I think that being aware of the elements in these movies that haven't aged well and understanding why is necessary to create more inclusive movies and stories in the future. And some of this definitely needs to remain in the past, like Laurence Olivier in blackface playing a person of color in Khartoum when you could have just cast a person of color. I have 30,000 soldiers in my camp. Is it because you are so brave or so foolish that you come here alone, unarmed? So as these big 70mm presentations have faded away, in their place exists the same problem where this all began though. When the television started to make its way into homes, studios needed something to entice people to see movies in theaters still, and they did that through special experiences like 70mm, Cinerama, and IMAX. Today with streaming and an overabundance of movies and media, we're seeing so many things underperform in theaters and studios not knowing how to get audiences interested in seeing movies in theaters like they used to, so what's next? How does the theater experience change or reinvent itself? Who knows? The movie industry is in a much needed upheaval at the moment, as the people behind all these things we get to watch are fighting for fair pay and treatment against colossal studios. Movies today are, at the very least, more accessible to both watch and make than ever before. But there has to be a middle ground in here where people are paid what they deserve, things remain accessible for different audiences, and maybe sometimes the passion and care is taken to put together a special release that reminds us that movies can be magical. 
That's it. Sure. Look. It's a big W, I tell you. That might not always come from these big chain movie theaters, so in place of that, my heart lies with all the little, independent, small-scale theaters that are still alive today. They're not doing big 70mm presentations, nor are they trying to create those same styles of experiences, but lots of these places strive to create a variety of diverse and accessible programming, encourage a community, and have a lot of charm that a massive theater chain can never, ever come close to achieving while also making going to the movies fun. Which in the end, is exactly what all of this is about.